would you like to improve your health and keep your family safe? You're listening to the Healthy Home Hacks podcast, where we firmly believe enjoying optimal health shouldn't be a luxury. Healthy Home Authorities and husband and wife team, Ron and Lisa, will help you create a home environment that will level up your health. It's time to hear from the experts. Listen in on honest conversations and gain the best tips and advice. If you're ready to dive in and improve your well-being and increase your energy, you're in the right place. All right, here are your hosts, bow biologists, authors, media darlings, vicarious vegans, and avocado aficionados, Ron and Lisa Barris. Life is a painting and you are the artist. You have on your palette all the colors in the spectrum, the same ones available to Michelangelo and Da Vinci. Paul J. Meyer. When it comes to living a healthy life, most people focus on nutrition, fitness, meditation, therapy, and other forms of self-care. While these are all necessary, there is another aspect to living healthy that many people ignore. In fact, research shows that there's a strong relationship between our physical spaces and our mental well-being. Our environments, including our office and home, impact the way we think, feel, and behave. It turns out, by using colors consciously in your space and understanding the meanings and influence of colors on the human mind and body, you can enhance the psychology of your space to improve your well-being, health, and happiness. Today, our special guest, Maynaz Khan, the founder of Color Conscious Living, is here to help us take a hard look at how colors impact our thoughts and actions on an everyday basis. And how color in our homes is impacting our behavior and emotions. Listeners, you're probably wondering how you can use the power of colors to create a positive environment at home that is in alignment with your subconscious mind. Today, we're going to find out. Manaz Khan is an interior designer with a focus on color and design psychology. She uses color as a wellness tool to help women create a stress-free and restful home so they can be more productive, sleep better, and cope with everyday anxiety, something everyone could use in today's volatile landscape. Welcome to the show, Manaz. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Oh, welcome, Manaz. We're so happy to have you with us. At the top of the show, before we started, we were talking about how much this topic is so important and not really discussed a lot. I think it's something that is underlooked. And yet so, so important as we're all going to find out as we get going today. I am a prior interior designer, as you are an interior designer. And I think we understand that power of color. So I can't wait to dive in and get to the nitty gritty of how it's affecting us. So let's just get started. So Minaz, it sounds like your journey into founding Color Conscious Living began after you became a mother. And while you should have been feeling fulfilled You are unhappy, anxious, and exhausted, which I know a lot of new moms can relate to. Can you describe how your home environment was not aligned with your goals of feeling blissful and happy? And can you explain a bit more for our listeners and share your personal story and struggle? So initially, this was 15 years ago. That's when I had my first baby. So, you know, I was very young, 23, 24, and what I learned from my society, what everybody else does, it's all about making it pretty. If I can make it pretty, then I'm going to be happy. And yeah, beautiful I, nursery, right? <laughs> <laughs> so our, our first apartment, we were recently married. The baby came suddenly. Everything was going too fast. And he was born like perfect timings in October, which is exactly when seasonal depression starts. Oh. And we lived in Buffalo, New York, which is, okay. no, eight months out of the year. All oh, right. No appearance. So, you know, everything was perfect scenario for depression. We were in a new marriage. We had an arranged marriage and we were just married. After, you know, one month of married, I conceived. So the baby came really soon. My husband is a physician. He was in his first year of residency, which is crazy. So I barely saw him. I barely knew him. Oh, wow. And the baby blues. And I think this is the worst part. And we were just talking about this last week, the morning when I came back home 
from the hospital with the baby that night, he started working night shifts for a whole month for a whole oh, third. No. He's like, you're on your own, honey. <laughs> oh my God. So I take all the credit. I say, no parenting. Okay. They're all mine. And I'm the <laughs> That's so, like the perfect I, storm. That's crazy. It's like, this is working out snow. well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then once you are in depression, you don't recognize it. This is something I've learned. Once you are in the rut, you have absolutely no idea. And then year after year after year, things, you know, you're growing, kids are growing, more kids are coming, we're moving around, job, all the things. So I had this episode of depression for eight years. Oh, wow. Eight years, which I had no idea. And in between, at one point, the doctor told me every year, antidepressants, antidepressants. Uh, mm. right. In my mind, I had this like, oh my God, taboo. I can't take antidepressants. Like no. I'm normal. I'm fine. Like, yeah. so I'm not telling anyone if you need it, definitely take it. I took it after resisting for so many years. And what happened? I'm that 5% of the population who is sensitive to every medication. Mm. And I was in bed for seven days, just one day of medication in bed, seven days. My wow. youngest was a year and a half. So I had two kids at that time. My mom had to come. She had to help. Of course, my marriage was breaking. Like this woman is in bed. What do oh, I do? Oh, no. Kids are crying. The house is a mess. And that's when I decided I can do it without this. I'm strong. I'll do it with willpower and motivation. So that's how I started. But, you know, then God came in. Mother Nature came in. And this was like literally light bulb moment for me a few years later that your environment impacts behavior. And uh, that's where everything started, color psychology, understanding the subconscious mind, the environment. And I want to say this, that there's so much and so far you can go with motivation and willpower. You always need an extrinsic motivator. There's and only I'm, so many mantras you can tape on the mirror. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So environment for me has been the best thing. Okay. Changing your mind. Wow. We, our stories are parallel a little bit because I was an interior designer and then I got sick from toxins in my home. And all of my health ailments, nobody could explain. And it wasn't until I connected my environment. Now, mine were actually toxins from a newly remodeled home and I didn't have little babies. <laughs> so, But it's interesting. We both had to connect the environment to how we were feeling. Whereas doctors and the Western Medical Association very much wants to mask symptoms and just take this pill, take this pill, you'll feel better. And we're really just masking. We're not getting to the root of what those causes are regardless if the medication isn't causing you problems, you really haven't found what caused it in the first place. You, and you're now dependent on something potentially for the rest of your life. You're both kindred spirits there. We are kindred yeah. spirits. Yeah. Yes. Wow. And that's interesting. I know the show isn't about depression, but because of the pandemic, we have so many people suffering from that right now. When you said it, you don't notice it. Is it just like you get used to feeling like that, that it becomes so normal that you don't think anything's wrong. Is that how you describe it? Yeah, I think you're just in the rut and you don't recognize it because I didn't. And now when I see back, I can tell, oh my God, that was bad depression. It was yeah. Well, and you, you probably blamed back because it. Because you're so positive right now. So you were recalling the story almost in a way like laughing at it and not laughing, laugh, laugh, and looking at it in such a positive way. So I'm glad you recovered and you yeah. went through that. And that's yeah, really tough. Eight years people. of depression. That's very difficult. Yeah. And I guess you must have chalked it up as postpartum and thought it's just because I have a baby and I'm more stressed now. Is that what you kind of thought was the yes, reason? Yes, it started with postpartum baby blues, but I didn't learn about seasonal depression for a very long time. And we were talking about this. I'm originally from Pakistan. So I've lived in Pakistan. I've lived in the Middle East. I've lived in different parts of the world. And there, in that part of the world, in Asia, in the Middle East, there is no such thing, I think, as seasonal depression in your vocabulary because the sun is shining all the time. When you okay. move to Buffalo, New York, all right. it, wasn't, it did not even exist in my vocabulary. And what Right, the, so you didn't you know, know. That makes sense. Position. We still yeah. went through all of this. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I grew up on the West Coast. Well, I was born in Boston, but I really grew up on the West Coast. So I think I would feel that if I moved to a cold, rainy climate, because I've been in the sun for so long. Arizona is where I really grew up and then lived in California my whole adult life so far. So yeah, I can see that that would be like, whoa. Oh, I, I agree. I have an adult example because I grew up on the East Coast and you're right. The seasonal changes, you go into the winter, it's a little more depressing. I couldn't imagine juggling everything that you were. Yeah. When I moved to California, Southern California in particular, I was just surprised that we can walk outside and feel happy in January and February. Right? For the holiday, you know, it was so November, crazy. December. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. We're very spoiled. Where are you now? Where are you located now? 
Okay, so in the middle of the story, we moved to Florida for years. Uh-huh. And voila, that year, no depression, no <laughs> depression. <laughs> we were in Amazing. Orlando. So this is the part that I want everybody to really focus. We're back in upstate New York. We're in Albany now, but we're still okay. in New York. It's not as bad as Buffalo, a little bit better. But this was a decision that I made that I want to come back. It's fine because my family is in Brooklyn, so we're close by. But now, because I have that awareness, I'm conscious. Okay. This is going to be our third winter ever since we're back. No depression. No oh, okay. Well, Manaz, so we know why. Out. Our listeners mm-hmm. can't see this, but behind you is this beautiful red painting. You're yes. wearing a multicolored blouse, which has every mm-hmm. colors of the rainbow. Yeah, we'll put a snapshot. You are, you are basically sunshine. You are a rainbow right now. So it doesn't matter <laughs> if it's snowing outside, you're fine, even though it is, <laughs> it is warm right yes. now. Yes, that's but, one mistake I made, you know, when initially when we got married and we were decorating our first apartment, the trend is trend, following the trends, all white, white is easy to match. If I have a white couch, mm-hmm. I can match pillows and all the stuff. Yeah. So the walls in the apartment were white. Everything else was white. I yeah. opened my windows. It's white outside, like uh, white inside the house when I can just open the windows and see it. Yeah. So I refused to use color and did not understand mm-hmm. the power in colors. And that was a mistake. Yeah. Wow. Well, Manaz, today it seems like everyone wants a neutral color scheme from grays yeah. and whites to natural wood tones. Do you see a disconnect from what looks like on Instagram and Pinterest worthy, but maybe it's not the best color palette to suit the inhabitants of a home? I love this question. My favorite question. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of factors. So we want a good balance with color. We want to be stimulated with color and we want to be relaxed with color. So too much or too less of anything is always bad. You know, you have that perfect taste of salt in your food, not too much, not yeah. too little. So we need color. The best way to understand color is that every color is equal to an emotion. And I'll go a little in the detail how color is processed by our brain, because that's the problem. We think color is about looks, it's aesthetics, but how is color processed? Color is basically light. And when light enters our eye, that is reflected by an object. It enters our eyes, it's measured in wavelengths. And that wavelength is processed in our brain Somewhere here, again, people can see is but in your brain, there's a small part called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus does this calculation, depending on the wavelength that enter and triggers, tells us that it's a color. But there are other things that the hypothalamus processes, such as appetite, metabolism, hormones, body temperature, reproductive functioning, so many other things. So anytime a color is computed by the brain, something else is triggered. Behavior, mm-hmm. emotions, thoughts, feeling. And this is why color is no more just a visual stimuli. It creates biochemical and hormonal changes in the human mind and body. Mm. So where were we? That is so interesting. Well, you have your metabolism. So what color does that, what color boosts your metabolism and (laughs) makes you fit? (laughs) Which color gives you instant muscles? Instant, yeah. (laughs) Muscles from Brussels, yeah. I'll go back to the emotion part first. Color is equal to an emotion. So when somebody says that I'm a neutral person, this is how it sounds. We know we need all supplements, magnesium, iron, vitamin D, vitamin C, all are important for the human body to survive, but we all have different needs. My vitamin D could be low, so I'm going to take a vitamin D. I'm not going to come out and say, Lisa, vitamin C is the latest trend. You should take that. Or I'm going to say vitamin C. I'm a vitamin C person. You should take vitamin C. Say you're a crazy woman. That's not how it works. (laughs) When you say I'm a neutral person, that's how it sounds. Because oh. we need all emotions. Oh. A normal human being lives in all states of emotion. During the day, you have ups and downs. You're really excited. You go down. You're okay. You can be really sad, upset about something. Then your levels come in the middle. So that's natural. So living in a few colors is just natural. And we can see this in Mother Nature. Mother Nature has proved to us. Yes. Mother Nature is abundant with color. It's interesting because I find myself going through like phases. So... I am in a pink phase, as you can tell with my pink shirt. I'm in a pink phase (laughs) and not just pink, deep, bright pink. I'm using it in branding. I'm noticing I'm buying clothes like that. And I never really was into pink before. And I've noticed that I've done this a lot in my life. So back when we first started our very first business, greennest.com, it was a retail store. It was during the time when browns and deep reds and golds and greens were really popular in home design. and my website were those colors, my clothes were those colors, my home were those colors. And so it was really interesting. And so I don't know if you found that with people where they'll kind of get in a zone and even their car, you know, or (laughs) 
things like that. Like you were saying that we need to go deeper and not just look at the surface. So your attraction to a color is a sign to go deeper and figure out what's going on internally. So at a different stage in your life, you're attracted to a different color. 10 years later, you might be hating this color. So as a teenager, you like a color in your thirties, you know, you're a different stage in your life. You're more mature. You maybe have a family, you're settled. So your attraction changes. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. One of my clients before she was my client, she wanted everything white in her life. She wanted to wear white. Home was white. I am a recovering white person. (laughs) (laughs) That was my phase before pink. Okay, so think about what was going on in your life at that stage. So in her life, that was an instant indication that there is something going on. And then when we started having this conversation, it came up that she was going through a divorce. She had two kids, an 11-year-old and a 12-year-old. She did not have a job and, you know, she needed a new place to live. So she had just so much emotional and noise in her life that she wanted to shut down. And this is why she wanted everything. Wow. Not like she wanted no noise. So mentally and emotionally, she Mm -hmm. was so disturbed. So anytime there's too much attraction to a color, yeah, this is a sign. That's a sign. I need to think about it, what's going on. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. I think when I was doing the white thing, it was a lot of, I don't know, the white car, the white iPhone, the white computer. I was just noticing that I kept buying everything white. I think for me, I was very distracted. I had a lot going on and I think I wanted like a blank canvas that things weren't pulling me and distracting me. So I could have like a laser a focus on balance. You're yeah. Really look, we're yeah. I wasn't wearing white all the time or anything yeah. like that. It was more just having kind of a blank canvas from which to create from. But as a past interior designer myself, I belong to an international professional organization called Color Marketing Group. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're great. And it's comprised of professionals in the automotive, fashion, and retail industries, including designers, marketers, color scientists, consultants, educators, and artists. Their tagline is color sells and the right colors sell better. <laughs> <laughs> they explain you live in color and so do we. Its influences are everywhere. The environment, social issues, changing political climates, they all impact color in one industry, which have a reverberating effect on another. Maynas, tell us about the psychology of color. For example, how does the human mind process colors, which you kind of alluded to, and What is the impact on us on an emotional and psychological level? Okay, so you were asking about metabolism and appetite. So one color that you should stick away, which actually kills appetite, is blue. And in interior design, blue is a big fashion in kitchen and dining room. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm always like, no, 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 no. And if you come to think about it in nature, I take all my answers from nature. When your food turns bad, leave meat in the refrigerator for 10 days, go back and look at it. It's going to turn blue. So nature, mother nature has created these signs for us that blue in food is poisonous. It's bad. So you're not going to taste it. You're not going to smell it instantly. You know, you're going to throw it away. So that's what's when you're bringing blue closer to food in the kitchen, in the dining room, it's killing that appetite. Now, Many people are going to say like, if you're trying to lose weight. (laughs) Yeah, that's great, right? But what's going to happen? You're going to start eating unhealthy because you are going to get hungry when you move around and then you're going to be really hungry and you'll eat something that's wrong. So that's not the right way to do it. (laughs) That is so interesting. And that's getting really deep on color. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Everyone's doing the dark blue lower base cabinets and kitchens, right? With the white uppers and grays. That's so popular right now. Yeah. Yeah. And as somebody who lives consciously and intentionally, I like to think about why do I need to follow this trend? And, you know, we just follow trends. We need to start questioning just because everybody else is doing it. We're like, it must be the right thing. But think about Coca-Cola. Everybody else is drinking it. Mm -hmm. And when my kids are in a party, they're like, can we drink Coke? I'm like, no, it's poison. And they look at me like everybody else is drinking poison. Yeah. So? So yeah. Good mom. Of- By the way, off topic yeah. there. Great job. Kudos, yes. Kudos. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Shout out to that. Everybody else is drinking it. And are you telling us they're drinking poison? So that's yeah. what example that everybody understands that just following the trend does not mean what everybody else is doing is the right thing. So we need to start questioning. And this is how color psychology in the kitchen area plays. Now, what color should you use instead? Green. Any shade of green that represents your personality. So the best color for the kitchen is red orange and yellow. And the way I work when I am designing spaces is we look at the purpose of the space and the kind of activity that's happening in the space. So cooking is first of all, emotional. And secondly, 
it is physical. It is not a mental activity. So blue is also the color of the mind. The color of the physical is red and the color of the emotion is yellow. So like I said, cooking is emotional and physical. So great colors to bring in your kitchen is yellow and red. Now, we don't want to paint our cabinets red or have too much red or yellow because they are highly energizing colors because it's Mm -hmm. a longer wavelength of lights. It's more energy and cooking is already heating up your kitchen. So these colors together are going to get your kitchen environment really heated up. So Mm -hmm. instead, we can bring in green to cool down the environment. Mm -hmm. So bring in your reds and your yellows and oranges through accessories, tabletop appliances. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. So you could have a contemporary modern kitchen with your white cabinets and then kind of use those colors. Yeah. And I I think of plants and herbs when you say the greens, we can bring that in through. And that's that's those colors in nature, in food, oranges and reds and greens, no blue. Yeah, you get the answer from nature. There is no debate about that. So the color that boosts the appetite is orange. Okay. Interesting. I remember learning this when I was in college, going studying interior design, the power of colors. So reds, yellows, oranges are highly energetic, like you said. And that's why you see them a lot in fast food restaurants, because they do want you to eat and get out. <laughs> right? They don't want you lingering for an hour. And also the surfaces, the textures. So in fast food restaurants, you don't have cushiony benches. You have hard or mica type laminate hard surfaces that you aren't going to get too comfortable to stay too long. They don't want you lingering in there. They don't want you to linger. True, true. Yeah. On the spectrum, we have Starbucks. They want you to linger. You buy one coffee, you buy a second coffee, you spend your eight hours with your laptop. I did that a lot in New York City during my college days. And that's how they make the money. So you yeah. just go into these two environments, the color and the whole environment. Feel. environment. Yeah. And there is no architecture in these two, the coffee shop and the burger, fast food. There is no architecture element. If you notice, the only thing is color. Yes. The feeling and the vibe is coming from color. There's color. No, just plain big boxes. That's right. It. Just a square. Yeah. It just depends on that. And also another interesting thing was in hospitals, they use a lot of blues and greens with the scrubs and all of that. And that is because those colors are so calming and healing. Obviously green, we think of with the healing and nature and all of that. So that's really interesting too. Can you imagine trying to recover in a hospital room that was like bright red or orange? That would be so stressful, right? You wouldn't be able to kind of calm down and get to that Zen state. It's amazing to know that colors are not just aesthetics, right? So there's a deeper meaning and how it affects your everyday life. Do you have any other examples? I have heard in the past that Kind of like you mentioned the food, right? The fast food, the red and the yellow together makes you stimulated to want something quick and leave, right? Is that the whole, you know, how many fast food chains do we see that have the red and, and all yellow? Of all of them. All, all, of, them. all of them. Yeah. In and out. In and out. Literally, they tell you the name. Come <laughs> in right. and get out. I did and also. <laughs> yeah. For those who are colorblind, right? For those who are colorblind, they need in and out. So you need a little reminder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It hit you on all levels. Yeah. And I mean, as I was talking earlier about Ron had a red office when red was really popular in interior home design. I had this beautiful Ralph Lauren dark red velvety paints and it was in Ron's office. It was so stimulating. And that was a period of your life where you were very anxious, very stressed. You know, you're in this office all day. And, and it was cosmetically to, very pleasing. That was, it was yeah, beautiful. It was pretty. But I think you're at 20, we're well not 24, maybe 24 hours a day, close to it, right? 16 yeah. hours a day. In that room, I felt overstimulated after a while. I was was feeling burnt out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's definitely going to happen. Yeah. Especially, I don't know how you concentrated so much. One thing, Ron, you said was, we're talking about this conversation and it's my mission that colors are not mere aesthetics. They're actually a survival mechanism for everyday life. So whatever anybody's belief is nature, universe, God, God has created colors as a survival mechanism for everyday life. They make our life simple and our life easy. So that first cup of coffee in the morning you have, it's a color decision. So my husband likes his coffee a little darker, which means less milk, and mine is pretty much all milk. So instantly in the morning, I'm pouring creamer in his coffee, just looking at it, that's enough, it's his coffee. And And if I walk away and somebody comes and mixes our coffee, instantly looking at the color, I can tell which one is his and which one is mine. Yeah. If we lived in a black and white world or a colorless world, we would be measuring every teaspoon of creamer. Five for him, eight for yeah. him. So you uh, see, in small things that make our life fast and easy. And then we already mm-hmm. spoke about the food thing, which is mm-hmm. protects us. It keeps us safe. 
if yeah. we were again in black and white world, we couldn't tell. So mm-hmm. my daughter, she's almost seven now and she was two and we're grocery shopping. She could instantly from a distance tell that we're getting the yellow banana because it's ready to eat and the green one is not. Yeah. She didn't have to go touch it, smell it, feel it. Yeah. Instant decision. So wow. So it's life easy. It's just, it's just. It perfect. communicates. Color communicates with us. Yeah. It really does. I, I tell you what, I remember the special that Lisa and I watched on television years ago. It was reminding me when you said you would need eight scoops or five scoops for the, co- whatever, the analogy <laughs> for the coffee, right? Well, there was this mathematician who was absolutely brilliant and they couldn't figure out why his mind works so fast. He saw pie. Yeah, the pie. He could go and- He saw three, numbers four, in one, color. Four, blah, he blah, saw blah, them blah, in blah, color. Blah, blah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they asked him because he never stopped. He could keep going with the formula. It just, the, the, hours, hours and hours they recorded him. He just wouldn't stop at the numbers. And they said, how- do you do that? And he said, I'm going to close my eyes. I see them in color. Yes. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Wow. I was yeah. like, very hey. few people like that on the planet. They're just wired differently than we are. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because me and numbers, we don't get along yeah. so well. No, they have some <laughs> like their phones and rods, which process colors. So they have a little bit different wiring. Yeah. Yeah. That's some serious different wiring. So many of us are telecommuting these days due to the pandemic. How does our home or our home office impact our behavior and subconscious mind? How is this all affecting us subconsciously? So again, you want to think about the purpose of your space, office, what sort of work you do. My work is going to be a little bit different than somebody who's an accountant or a lawyer. So the kind of concentration you have. And then again, we break it down. How much of the mental work is there? How much of the physical work is there? For example, typing is physical. Making phone calls is a physical activity. So you do need some of that red also. Okay. And you want to be more mentally stimulated. So where you're going to use colors that are mentally stimulating rather than in a bedroom, you mm-hmm. want colors that are mentally relaxing. Mm-hmm. You shut down that mind, no thoughts racing when you hit the pillow. So that's how we divide the colors and figure out what are the five to six different colors you should have in your surroundings to help you get that work done. What are those? Okay. <laughs> what are those? So First thing is, you know, that colors have different tones and undertones. So if I say green, that does not answer the question. You have to find out which tone of green is going to work for you. But like I was saying, a mentally stimulating color is saturated blue. So dark blues are always mentally stimulating. So blue is the color of the intellect. And light blues are always mentally soothing. The reds or the derivative of reds, which is orange and pink and browns, they're all derivatives of red, are physically stimulating. Oh. And then we go for a light pink, a light red, which is pink, like a soft pink, yeah. that's physically soothing. And the yellows are emotionally stimulating. Yeah, it was making me think of spas, you know, going to a spa, how it's always in a more pastel palette. There, you never see deep dark Glowing. colors. Yeah, yeah, in a spa. You're not going to unwind with those dark colors. Around. Yeah, it's so interesting. Later, a true. little off topic. I read an article just recently that talked about how birds see a higher spectrum of light, which means they actually see different colors than what the human eye actually sees. And so many yeah. times when we see a bird and he may look like a plain brown, gray, spotted bird, in reality, he might have vibrant colors that we just don't see. Have you heard that before? Yeah, yeah there's the limited spectrum of light that we can see and animals see differently. Some different animals like dogs, they have only two, two cones. Yeah. So they see less colors than we do. And then different animals would see it differently. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. And by the way, Ron, that bird could have been a she too. (laughs) You said he. Oh, (laughs) did I? Okay. Well, the. He or she. Absolutely. Actually in the bird world, the males are really the more colorful. And the, yeah. The that's females what, that's are really the think. gray. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe that's not true. No, it's true. <laughs> we don't feel, it. Like a peacock. <laughs> a peacock, yeah, is the male with his big feathers. Yeah. 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 That is so funny. Well, when Lisa and I first learned about the chakra system and their yeah. respective colors, I started using color as an energy when I dressed. I was very cognizant of that. So for example, blue represents the throat chakra. So if I was given a business presentation or a speaking engagement, I would choose to wear a blue shirt. So Manaz, is color subjective or do the hues and shades actually affect us whether we like or dislike a particular color? Yes. Again, one of my favorite questions, if color is subjective or not. So the general idea is the color is subjective and I'm going to go ahead and say it's not. 
So let's rule out nothing in life is absolute, right? You take medication, let's say diabetes medication. We know it works. It does things. But if any of us, God forbid, has diabetes, it's going to be a little different. We're going to get a different dose. Maybe one of us takes it in the morning. The other person takes it twice a day. Vitamins, all of these vitamins, they're all important. They have universal properties, but they work a little bit different for everybody. Sugar, how I taste it, that's how you taste it. Anybody across in the world in Australia is going to taste it. So the property of sugar or salt or anything is universal, but it's a little different how it works on all of us. So same goes for the color. The properties of color, what we have been talking about, the reds and the blues, that is universal. Now we're going to have a little bit of a different reaction. Why I'm saying it's not subjective is because there is always a reason why you're attracted to a color and it's either one of the three. The first one, it could be your personal experience. For instance, I have a dark green couch and my cousin brother, he hates that couch. So we did one, like, <laughs> why is he hating my couch? <laughs> yeah. Turn out, long time back, he had a relative who had a dark green couch and the room was very depressing. They didn't have any light. And there were his dad's relative who were very mean to his mom. So oh. there was that also. So that's what he recalls. So that's a personal experience. That's not the psychology of green. And that's not that I'm going to hate green or somebody else. It's his personal experience. So anybody could have a good experience or a bad experience. And that's how they connect to it. You yeah. have these fragrances, you connect it to an event or music, you connect it to an event. So color also, you connect to an event. Right. Yeah. I bet so if you were in a car accident in a certain car, yes, car yes. that would So many up. people do. Definitely. Yeah. They hate mm-hmm. that color. They're scared of it. And all mm-hmm. the things that's connected to it. Yeah. So that's one reason. The second reason is culture. What part of the world you've grown out? What culture did you grow up? For instance, in India and other countries in Asia, the widow wears white. She wears all white. Here in the U.S., ah. the bride wears white on her wedding day. So I'm sure. What, in old- what are they saying here? It's the end of her life if she's going to be married. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's going to have a heart attack. Like, what is it? So oh, that's interesting, right? Because in India. My sister's husband is Indian and we went to their wedding and it was so colorful, right? The right. saris and the gold. And I was wearing so blue and she was wearing red. I don't know if the bride always wears red. She had red with yes, gold. Yes, mostly. Yeah. I was like, whoa, this is so beautiful. Oh, yeah, it was a beautiful celebration. Of just a cornucopia of colors. Not only yeah. that, gold was really seen that, right? So gold, but you wear gold at the wedding, yeah. right? So metallics, is that part of the color spectrum that you focus on too, Manaz? you get into like what so we focus as, as a design element so it comes from okay. your personality but we focus as a design element and again gold is pretty much yellow coming from the yellow family silver is coming from the white family like that yeah it's more of a status symbol gold in that part of the world in asia mm-hmm. okay so it could be a cultural thing it could be your country's the color of the flag and then you associate those colors with you know on fourth uh, of july everybody is this food is going to be the color of the flag yeah clothes and everything. So that kind of association. So it could be a cultural thing also. And the last thing is the psychology of colors, the the universal properties of colors. Now, the thing to notice here is whatever your experience has been with the color, good, bad, cultural thing, over time, the psychology of color will take in because it's happening inside your brain, right? So you're not going to think consciously at a subconscious level, the psychology of color will overpower it. Let's say, for instance, red is your really, really favorite color. You love it for some reason and you want to paint your bedroom all red. So right now you're thinking that, yes, it's my favorite color. I'm going to love it. Don't stop me from doing my favorite color in my bedroom. But over time, when you keep going to your bedroom, you're not going to notice that. You're going to get so used to it. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to think about like, I painted my wall red because it's my favorite color. Every time you go into your bedroom, you're not going to say that. So yeah. over time, the psychology of red is going to take over. And like I said, it's a very stimulating color. So it's not a good choice for a bedroom where you want to relax and you want to calm down. So over time, psychology of color always wins. And because it's at a subconscious level where we're not even thinking about it. Oh, right. I was talking about the group that I belong to, Color Marketing. And there were people from the movie industry that would attend these conferences and the thought of how they incorporate color into a movie is very well thought out too. And you think about, well, why? Because the viewers and how are those colors going to affect us when we watch them and evoke an emotion that they're trying to get. So that's really interesting too. It goes very deep. And I remember as an interior designer learning about opposite colors. So red and green, 
they create a vibratory effect when they are next to each other because they're so opposing and they create almost what feels like a vibration. So these types of colors are very stimulating. So you obviously wouldn't want opposing colors in certain situations where you need to be calm and things like that. So I thought that was interesting. So everyone listening has a favorite color. Is this random, Manaz? Or can there be a reason we're attracted to particular colors at particular times in our life? We kind of touched upon lacking something or needing something. True. So yeah, it's going to be one of those or it's going to be that incident, something happened in your life and you've associated with the colors and that's what your favorite color is. Then again, you want to think about it. Is your favorite color the right choice for where you want to use it in your home? Again, the red in the bedroom because yes, it is your favorite color, but it does not mean that it is the best color for you. Think about it, your favorite food. Let's say you love a double cheeseburger. It is your favorite food. Okay, Manaz, we're vegan. We're vegan, Manaz. <laughs> We've had a lot let's of go, meat let's references. Let's jokes and yeah, 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 there we go. Something crazy. <laughs> but what's your favorite dessert? Oh gosh. I'm sure uh, I believe you're vegan. I do like vegan, red velvet vegan cupcakes. Red Those are good. vegan cupcakes. Yeah, from Sprinkles. Those are good. <laughs> <laughs> I have not tried them. But <laughs> anything that's, you know, usually something that's rich and creamy and a lot of sugar or something like that, it's mostly people's favorite thing, but does not mean that it's necessarily a good thing for their body. Yeah. So same way could be the favorite color. It's your favorite color, but it's different when you're, it's on your walls. It's different when you're wearing it. You can change your clothes 10 times a day, but you can't change your walls maybe even a few years. Yeah. Do you agree with the concept of creating a neutral palette and then using the colors as accents so that you can change those out depending on, you know, so the, like throw pillows and blankets and things like that, you can change easily. Do you like that style? I'm not going to say it's a personal thing. It's because the principles that I use are related to personality. We analyze your personality to figure out your colors. So when you have the colors that are in alignment with your personality, you will not need to feel the need to change them every season, five years, mm. eight, 10 years. So that mm. need vanishes, that I mm-hmm. need the change. Again, going deeper, people are not realizing, why do I need that change? There is a deeper mm. meaning. Why do mm. I go to Target every week and I need new things? And it satisfies me for a week, and then I'm back again after a week. Mm. So again, go deeper. What's going on? It's not that I just got this hedonic adaptation. You get something mm-hmm. new and you like it and it looks different. But next week, you're back to square one because you did not go deeper. Why do I need to shop every time? Why do I need to change my decor? So Mm -hmm. yes, in a way, I don't change my decor seasonally. And because now I have the right colors, I don't need to change it. They reflect my personality. So that's going to vanish. Right. That's so interesting. Yeah, we are very much, you know, a disposable society. And it's marketers use this tactics really wisely to get us to constantly... Feel like we need the next thing, whether it's fashion, right? I think about this with fashion all the time. It's like, well, what yeah. was wrong with that pair of shoes? Oh, pointed toes aren't in anymore. Now we need square toes. Oh, now square toes are. And as you can tell, it's not real. Who cares what shape your shoe is? I mean, we should be using these until we're done with them, not, oh, they're out of style now. It's a matter of ethics now. Changing your decor four times a year, the wastage you're creating, it's not sustainable for the environment. And we're seeing all of those issues. And I think that's one reason why color psychology is not so popular because if everything <laughs> has their color and they don't change it in 10 years, how are the big brands going to make the money? So Yeah, how are they going to make the money? I don't think Instagram and Pinterest have this area in us. I mean, it's like, they're going to hate me. They're you know, not. Chromotherapy, chromotherapy or therapy with colors in light, pharmaceutical medicine is not going to make money. And we know where pharmaceutical medicine does not make money, you guys mm-hmm. you're taking care of toxins and herbs and eating natural that's yeah. not so famous, not so popular. Interesting that you said that because even think about the colors in pharmaceuticals. I mean, pills are very colorful. You know, if you see like a, you buy a stock photo of pills, there's like red and green and pink and yellow. Yeah. And blue. There's got to be something there too that they're sell tapping the into to sell the pill, right? To make but the what pill if we don't buy the pill. We just use in color without buying the pill. So that's where they don't make the money. Yeah, right. Exactly. Oh, yeah. So interesting. Well, Manaz, my financial wheels were spinning. So can color affect the sales or rental of homes? What do you recommend or advise against in terms of real estate if you're renting or selling your home? Okay. Yes, it definitely affects sale. We see this all the time. So many times big brands do this in the market. They just change the color of the packaging and instant sale. There's so many examples mm-hmm. like this. Mm-hmm. I don't okay, remember. What color? <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the product. It depends on yeah. the product. There was this washing powder, which was not selling. I think it was in Britain. It was not selling. 
and they changed everything was the same. The whole powder inside was same. They just changed the color of the packaging. And it was mm. so it's going to be different mm-hmm. what color it is. When it's food, it's washing powder, different things are going to be different. A simple tip I will give you on the website, you've noticed those buy now buttons or Mm -hmm. get now, shop now being Mm -hmm. red. Mm -hmm. So that's because red is that longest wavelength in the visible spectrum of light. So it thinks that are red appear closer than they actually are. So that's like instant. You want that person to focus. (laughs) It has to be red or magenta. Yeah, it's instantly we want them to see, it. and we'll see yeah. them on the website. Also. So that's why I. Click the button. <laughs> so you're using it too. You're using it yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, mine is more like a magenta. It's not yeah. a red red, but that's again the longer wavelength. That's why they have it there. So they make wow. a lot of money by the signboards. When you're in a grocery store, the cell is all red. They want you to instantly notice. Right, a sale, and also subconsciously we associate that with the discount, right? I mean, if you see a red, yeah, now we if you see a price in red, you're just like, oh, it must be on sale. And that's another psychological thing too. It's just yeah, that was the connection we were talking about because in our culture we've learned that red is in the grocery store. The sign is discount or it's on sale, something like that. Yeah, and not only yeah. that, but in preparation for this call, Lisa and I were talking. It's the contrast of a couple of colors too that cause you to do things. So the stop mm-hmm. sign, red and white, right? That yeah. has a high contrast. And I think Lisa, you told me your background that it was a black and yellow is one of the highest contrasting color combinations and that's why they're used in all the hazard signs and warning signs and that kind of thing we see them in street signs and things like that so black and white obviously the biggest contrasting but then black and yellow i think is the next and it goes in line and if you look at all the transportation type signs you either have the blue and white which would be information and you have the green and white and then you have the red and white so it's really interesting how much color has been used to influence us and we don't know so now we know that the, what red means, the red stop sign, even if somebody can, well, yeah, the kids, they also recognize it, even if they can't read. So we know that, but let's go back and see in nature, what is red, yellow, and black? The buzzy bees, we get so scared of them. Mm-hmm. So yeah. In nature, danger is that black and yellow. Yeah. Be careful right. if you're wearing a combination. What is the sign you're sending to the person in front of you? So that's yeah. where they're picking that from. So now we right. know like yellow and Black, like you were mentioning, is hazardous. Well, yeah. Good, trick question for you, though, Manaz. Trick question. Okay. With the rainbow. We see a beautiful rainbow with all of the colors. What do we do? Do we just freeze and stare at it? Is that why we're looking at it in awe? What, what's, I think I mean, we don't see it all the time. So it's like when something is new and less frequent, we really stand mm-hmm. and appreciate it. But it has all the colors. So I guess that's just the mystery and beauty of the universe or whatever. It is. Okay. <laughs> all right. Wow. That is so interesting. This was great. I hope you guys listening have learned a lot and are inspired to really take a look at your environment, your wardrobe. Oh, one last thing I wanted to ask you. What if someone's really in a black phase? I mean, there are people who it's all black, black clothes. They want to dress fully solid black, their black car, their black phone. It's chic and sleek, right? It can be deemed high end, but obviously there's got to be a lot of negative associations to that. Too much of that. What would you say? Right. A lot of people say that black is chic. It's sophisticated. That's mm-hmm. true. hundred percent black is sophisticated. The question is, do you look sophisticated or chic in black? Yeah. So that does not sit with everyone. And then again, I see this all the time. I know personally know people who just want to wear black all the time. So there is mm-hmm. something at the back going on. Instant thing to pick up. Why does this person want to wear black? Are they trying to hide mm-hmm. something? So we feel like even though black, because black is an absorption of light, so the person can be feeling like I'm hiding. I want to hide mm-hmm. behind this color and they just feel like more cocooned or safe. Mm-hmm. There's always a reason why is it all the time black? Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of people who are self-conscious of their weight will tend to do that because they say, oh, it makes me look yeah. thinner. But then you'll see Funny. a heavier person in color. I've seen this a lot and thought, no, they don't look heavier in they color. Don't. They don't. It's very so psychological. It's, it's just basic common sense should i say because black absorbs all light black is all absorption of light when light is being reflected it's white and you see black because it's absorbing all light so you're never going to look thinner it's mentally (laughs) you're never going to look thinner (laughs) get rid of that black it adds weight so you know do this experiment anybody can do this experiment let's say you have a door an old door it's a white door and you want to change it and looks very clumsy and bad quality painted black instantly it's going to look better quality it's going to look like it's solid Do this experiment with anything in your life, one white and turn it into black because instantly it's absorbed all light, it's absorbed energy. 
Yeah, so yeah. the person who feels like that I'm looking slim is basically in their mind that mentally they feel like they're hidden. They are cocooning or isolating. So that's what's going on. Not that they're really looking slim. Mm. Yeah, they want to hide. I think that's true. Yeah. Get those colors out, friends. Start wearing some beautiful, bright colors. And I love how you talked about using the colors intentionally. So you're having a job interview. You want to be deemed trustworthy. Blues are great, right? That's sure. like conservative and trustworthy. And whether, like you said, whether you believe it or not, it's true. Psychologically, we, we are programmed to think of blue as trusting. It's policemen. It's, you know, these things that we've associated with trust. And so we can utilize colors definitely intentionally. I went through a black phase many, many, many years ago where, I don't know, I wasn't trying to look thinner. I think I just thought it looked sleek. And then I finally started wearing really bright colors. And you know what? It makes you feel better about yourself, right? You feel more vibrant and energized. Yeah. And get out from behind those neutrals, guys. Like start embracing. What would you suggest to someone who's kind of scared? A lot of people get scared. Like, oh, I don't want too much color in my home. Starting like, with a bathroom or something. Like you said, stick with those neutral walls and everything. Start small. Start, start small. with one pillow. But yeah. the biggest difference is that I am not buying this pillow because it is the latest trend or because it looks good or because it is Joanna Gaines advice or because my yeah. neighbors have it. No, I'm buying this color because of the psychological implication and influence of this color. Yeah. Just that change in the sentence mm-hmm. that it's a purple first decision. Now my green couch, everybody's like, it's out <laughs> of my comfort zone. <laughs> yes, but how am I living with that green couch? Because I made a purposeful decision. I did not base it on looks or trends or anything like that. That's fluff or surface level. Yeah. I know why I want it or why yeah. I have it and the energy it brings me. So I'm living with it and you will mm-hmm. live with it. So start small. It's okay mm-hmm. to start small, but every yeah. conscious step you're taking, it's going to build up. And then there will be a time that you'll be ready to do your walls. I mean, I yeah. wasn't like that. <laughs> right, exactly. My, you can see my wall behind me. It's very colorful. It's gray and yellow very geometric, vibrant pattern. And the reason I did it is because it's uh, it's a non-toxic adhesible, adhesive, removable wallpaper. And I was like, hey, I'm not attached to it. I can peel it off. It's a peel and stick and put up any, in fact, I have another one waiting to be changed. I'm going to, I'm going to do a neutral. I'm going to do a neutral after this. But I think I just also enjoy, it's a different pattern. You know, it's the designer in me. I do like to change things up a little bit. I've had this for years, but yeah, that's a good idea for you guys too, because now with these peel and stick wallpapers and paint is so easy to change. You don't have to be building your home with cabinet colors that you're going to be stuck with for life. You can actually do the changes. Like you said, start small, start with something that you can change if you don't like it or it doesn't feel good. Yeah. You'll be stuck with cabinets. So again, bring those appliances, small appliances we're renting. So we have a lot of artwork because we can paint our walls. We're not allowed to paint our walls. So oh, okay. Furniture. I love that. Painting uh, artwork, you. yeah. yeah. Artwork really works or doing the walls really works because it's eye level and anything that's eye level makes the biggest difference. I always say this, if you have the option of buying artwork or rug, always artwork. Oh, that's oh. a good point. You're going to see that first. Yeah. yeah. The only person who buys the rug notices the rug. Nobody looks at <laughs> <No. that. laughs> it's, it's like shoes. Like, yeah. <laughs> Ron thinks nobody looks at shoes. I always say, oh, you know, you got to polish your shoes or you're wearing those. He goes, nobody looks at shoes. I'm like, actually, they do. Some people are very <laughs> obsessed everybody with shoes. Their own, most. <laughs> yeah, most people are more concerned about their own. But on a last final note, you had talked about don't go for the latest trends. I've noticed like a trend in nurseries, baby nurseries is very adulty. It's very kind of bland. I'm seeing so many nurseries that are white with a little bit of black. And I'm like, what? I mean, I don't think you have to go overly pink and baby blue, but isn't that a happy room? I would want more color in a nursery. I don't think I would be jiving energetically with my little baby in this dark adulty vibe. I think you can make it tasteful and classy without doing bunnies everywhere, but adding some pretty color. How do you feel about that? Well, you answered your own question. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. You don't want to go for those dull, muted colors. Think about it. The energy of those colors is very like adult, like you said. Yeah. You don't want vibrant colors. You want colors that have childlike energy. And that's where yeah. your child is going to definitely thrive. Yeah. And it's so common, breaks my heart so much. All those muted, grayed out tones in the kids' bedroom. Yeah. That parents are pushing for, it's going to be a depressive for them. Oh, really? So that's yeah. interesting down the road. 
Yeah, I remember being very little and being just obsessed with color. I do, I remember like looking at toys. I mean, hello, that's why the toy aisle is so colorful. They know that children are attracted to that. So I would think your nursery, your little kids room, you want some fun colors in there that they can connect with. So, and guys, you can keep it, you can keep it trendy, classy, and beautiful at the same time. I shouldn't say trendy, but you can keep it classy and beautiful with still adding some nice color in there. Well, this was amazing. Thank you so much. And remember, friends, as RuPaul said, the whole point is to live life and be, to use all the colors in the crayon box. Friends, if you were inspired by today's show, head over to colorconsciousliving.com and book a color consultation with Maynaz. She can help you with a single room audit or a complete color transformation for your home environment. You can even get started with a complimentary call. Thank you so much for joining us today, Manaz. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. We loved it. This is amazing. I love your energy. (laughs) (laughs) We love yours. The colors are vibrant. It's my pick. pick. That's actually true. You know, I meet people who I used to know 10 years ago, and they're like, you're a very different person. I know I'm no more depressed. So you see, it Uh, shows. Yeah. When you showed up on camera, your outfit is vibrant. Your painting is vibrant. You can feel that energy instantly. I'm in the environment all the time. <laughs> You're both high vibe ladies. So high vibe. All right, okay. So stay tuned for another episode to off level your health, your home, and the planet. Bye. Bye, everyone. See you next time. This episode of the Healthy Home Hacks podcast has ended, but be sure to subscribe for more healthy living strategies and tactics to help you create the healthy home you've always dreamed of. And don't forget to rate and review so we can continue to bring you the best content. See you on the next episode.